Look away unto Jesus and say, Lord, because you have died on that cross, I am capable of receiving everything that cross has purchased for me. And sometimes God speaks over us and we're not willing to listen to wisdom. All of this is available to us through all of this good, awesome kingdom glory. And uh, today's message is about spiritual supremacy. Spirit supremacy. I, uh, it must be, it must be something to walk into a worship service like that for the first time. I remember when I came to Christ, I was at the church I walked into, they were just lifting their hands and it was just maybe a little sway here and there. And I was like, it just about blew my cork. You know, I was like, wow, what is this? And I, I just was thinking today. Religion will never make young people worship. Never. Never. Um, but the Spirit of God will. And the Spirit is present among us. Yes. That is real. Yes. That is real. I suggest you get on board. Yes. I, su I suggest you pour yourself in. Um, become a participant if you're not. Become a participant. Enter in. You know, the kingdom of God is in front of us. Eternity is in front of us. Um, we've been called by the grace of God to know him, to fellowship with him, to walk with him, to live for him, to express him. And to be a witness of him. And he hasn't called us into some religious service. He's called us into a true relationship. Now, anywhere, anytime, if someone says to me, who do you love? I'll say, I love Marge with my whole heart. And she's my wife. I've been with her for it'll be 35 years this July. And um, it doesn't grow old. I love her. I'm committed to her. Uh, her happiness matters to me. And I am unashamed to say that I will fight for that, I will work for that, and I do. In the same way, if someone asks for me uh, the hope that lies within me, I am unashamed to say I love Jesus Christ, I am a servant of God, I am a son of the Most High God, and I am called as an ambassador to this world to help reveal Jesus to this earth. And that's not because I'm a minister, it's because I'm a son of God. The word son in the in the, in the scriptural language means a builder of the family name. If you're walking down the street and you walk up to someone and, and they say, hi, how you doing? Nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and basically they ask you questions that are basically getting to the point of, who are you? You will say, well, I'm, you know, I'm so-and-so from this family from California or from Ohio or from New York or wherever you're from. And you, you'll start to paint a picture about your natural identity, right? right. You say, yeah, I know my, my, my grandparents, they immigrated from Italy, both the Scarenzi side and the Mingarelli side. They, they came here, both my grandparents, from Italy. And then people start forming an idea about you. And I say, and they moved here. Uh, the Mingarellis moved here because of Endicott Johnson uh, uh, was making shoes. And they get a job and a house for the immigrants. And, you know, so you start painting a natural picture. And then you say, well, and my, my grandmother on the Mingarelli side was pregnant in Italy and birthed my mother in America. You know, you could start, you're starting to formulate some kind of a picture. And say, my dad, um, I didn't know his family uh, at all, uh, almost nobody other than uh, one of my cousins. And the aunts, a little bit, met two of his sisters briefly. And, and I could tell you a whole picture about that, but didn't really meet the grandparents on that side, and there wasn't a lot of communication connection. And they'll say, why? They say, well, n we don't fully know. Something must have gone wrong. <laughs> right? So you start to get a picture about us. And then say, well, my dad was striving with the bills, and we had, I'm one of nine brothers and sisters. There's three girls, 
and seven boys. And my parents were trying to make it work on a minimal, itty-bitty income. We lived in a housing project because we were under, well, we didn't have enough money to go and get what other people had. So, in fact, I drove past there the other day with my granddaughter. I says, well, there's where Papa used to live right there, building 8F. She goes, Papa, you live there? I said, yeah. Not in the whole building, just this end. <laughs> 12 of us, 12 of us in four bedrooms. A measly <laughs> little living room, and like Larry says, one bathroom. <laughs> well, do you know that if you can't get in there, you pee in the laundry? Now, some of them didn't know, but there were emergencies, and uh, little boys will play. And uh, so you, you're starting to so you're starting to form a picture of our household. Teresa back there in the blue is my older sister. Now I've got a debt to pay. I mean, <laughs> she owes me, beat me up all the time. You know? <laughs> but you know, I was number five in ten. That puts me in the middle with Larry. I was five, he was six, we were in the middle. She's saying, what are you talking about? Well, I'm defining for you a little bit of my world, then I could go into the crazy side of our household, and I could go into the blessed, amazing side of our household. They were both present, because we're all from dysfunctional families. None of us did it exactly right, and we blame nobody for it. So there, you get a little snapshot, but that's all natural. Right. It's important, but it's natural. Right. The but is not to exclude it. It's important. I honored my father and mother. I loved them. I honor my brothers and sisters. I love them. My wife and my children are important to me. My son-in-laws are important to me. My grandchildren are important to me. Family matters. Does family matter? Does it matter to God? Yeah, he says, honor your father and mother. He talks about in, in Ephesians chapter 5, how we ought to treat our wives and how wives ought to treat our husbands. God has a plan for all of it. All of it. He didn't leave out the natural and deal with the spiritual. The spiritual created the natural, therefore the natural has to be influenced by the spiritual. If the natural came from the spiritual, then the spiritual must be inquired to know how to operate in the natural. If designers start designing in Detroit and they come out with a new car with no wheels, I would suggest you would consult them about how to operate that vehicle. Because it was in their minds and in their thoughts that the mechanisms, the systems, are all put in place to operate that vehicle so that you don't get killed or kill somebody else in the process. So you, you've got to go back to the creator. You've got to go back to the designer. You've got to go back to the one who made it to understand how it works. Do you know that presently today there are thousands of vehicles in America driving with no driver? Yeah. Yeah. I just heard it on the news the other day. They're talking about they're testing them all over the place. And they're just going all by themselves. They run this test. They've only had like 400 accidents so far. <laughs> and almost all the accidents were they were rear-ended by a human. Yeah. <laughs> Someone crashed into that car. But so what they're doing... They're trying to get rid of the driver. In fact, they already have a customer. The first customer who is really interested in it is some kind of a shuttle service, cab service thing, where you get in and push the button and tell it where you want to go, and it takes you there with no driver. It's coming. Okay, so I would suggest that you consult the manufacturer before operating this vehicle. Yeah, you know, I don't know how it's possible, but when GP, GPS and the whole 
navigational systems got into our cars and it says, turn here. And people turned into ponds yeah. and into fields. I mean, I don't know how, what planet they're on, but they did, they do. And they sue the company. And idiots reward them. But nonetheless, they now have all these, these things written to clearly define, not into a field, not into a pond, at the next intersection, and obey the traffic signals, and don't just do what this thing's telling you to do. <laughs> you know, and so you have to consult the manufacturer, otherwise sometimes you get into trouble. And yet, we are made natural beings in this world, and we don't think we need to consult the one who made us. We are more complicated than a car, a, 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 a driverless car. Marge and I were just listening to a science guy, and he was reminding us of the fact of that scientific minds of the past were studying the brain, the human brain, just the brain, not the rest of it. And they got so intrigued by the neurons and the the activity that's going on in the brain, which all these words that define all these things that I can't even talk about uh, correctly, and they were talking about how it's all symbiotic, it all relates to itself, and it's all inter intertwined with itself, and none of it works without the rest of it working. And they said the thing is so complicated, and there's such activity going on there, they say it would take a ghost to operate that brain. Holy ghost. And they literally, scientists have said, it would take some kind of a spirit to operate that brain. It's so sophisticated and complicated. And yet we were designed by God as spirit people, authored in heaven, inside the loins of our Father, waiting to be brought into this world. He created Adam and the flesh. Amen. All right, we agree. So the natural man, Adam, was created, made, designed. The voice Bible says, God took a scoop of soil and fashioned it into a man and then breathed into it. <laughs> Sounds like some sci-fi movie. And it became a living being. So, so when, the, when people say man is made, that's not all true. Natural man was made. You were not made. Your natural man was made, formed, fashioned by God. But you are not made. You are out of the loins of God, seed from heaven, sent into a body to exist as a spirit being. You are more than the physical frame that you occupy. Your temple is not your permanent location. Amen. Amen. So what you are is not what it appears you are. And I've said this to you before. I'm going to say it again. I love when scientists say things that just they get their minds so blown that they finally come out with these amazing statements. It is amazing some of the things that they've declared. Like one of the things Einstein said was, He's talking about the complexity of the human body and the multifaceted design of it, the intricate layers, not just at the surface level, but deep in the fabric of the cellular structure, in the atomic world that operates the sophisticated machinery, he called it. He says, and the fact that somebody would quote me in disproving God I find offensive. Yep. Yeah. 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 They quote him. And he said he was offended by the fact that they quote him that there is no God. He goes, how else can all this intricate design exist? It's impossible to exist on its own because it's all symbiotic. Yeah. Right. Right. Every cell needs every other cell. Every organ needs every other organ. And every part needs every part to exist. And not one can form by itself and, uh, and cause the others to exist. Otherwise, you'd have to have the miracle of all the cells forming at once to sustain the others. 
And I'm like, and my little brain gets ran like, oh. Now he then finally, after all that, made this statement. He said, this thing we call reality is really just a persistent illusion. And then the guy talking said, well, it begs the question, if it really is a persistent illusion, who created the illusion? He's like, what are you talking about? I came here for answers. You got me out in outer space. I'm drifted free here. I'm attached to nothing. Well, look, if we don't detach you from the lies that are holding you, then you can't get on to the supernatural. And if you understand it in the natural, it's not from the spirit because the spirit can't be known by the natural man. It is known by the spirit of man who can know the spiritual things. So if I'm a spirit man, I have to know things by my spirit, not by my brain. My brain can't measure God and my brain can't measure myself because I'm more than just a natural man. Are you more than a natural man? Yes. And you know, that's what everything in our society begs, the question. Why are we after the perfect looking person? Why are we after the perfect athlete? Why are we after the perfect superhero? Because within us is the knowledge that it exists. Yeah. Amen. Hmm. First John chapter 4. Come on, spread your wings. The Bible is here to challenge you to fly. Ready to fly. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, that means Christians. Man, Paul would have to rewrite this today. Or John, the apostle, he would have to rewrite it today. Because people don't believe this. But here it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beloved, do not believe. Do not believe. Can you say, do not believe? Do not believe. I thought we were supposed to believe. Well, we got to believe the right thing. Do not believe every spirit. So every spirit is not to be believed. But test the spirits. Whether they are of God. Now, I, one of the tests you can do on a spirit, because this is not necessarily talking about a demon or an angel. It's talking about people. People. It's that, it's the, it's, we have a, we are a spirit. We have a spirit, and we are one. And so is your neighbor. Don't believe every spirit. So right now, because I'm speaking and I'm standing up here, does not make what I'm saying true. We need to know what God's word says because he authored life and he is Detroit of the human race. Except, no, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> Detroit's a bad example. <laughs> it's, a, it's really a failed state. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets, see, people, many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know the spirit of God. Okay, so th this is the subject. There are false prophets, don't believe every spirit. Test the spirits. Now, how do you know? How do you know what's of God? And this is the test. It says, here's how you know. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. I'm telling you what, there are some major denominations that don't believe this. That is dangerous. In other words, Jesus came in the same created earth suit as you and me. 
He did not show up as a miraculous God in the flesh. He was human to the core. His natural man was the same as your natural man. And this is what this says. Don't believe every spirit. Some spirits are going to say, Jesus Christ, the supernatural God from heaven, came down and did miracles among us. That is not what happened. Jesus Christ, the spirit, came into a body, a human one, of a woman who was under the law. Therefore, he was under the law. And he was under a woman under the law, birthed by her, a natural being into this world. And he never sinned with his natural body. And you can ask some denominations. You can ask them. Well, why did Jesus never sin and we sin? Well, because he's the perfect one. He is the Messiah. He is different than us. No, he's not different than us. He was in the same body that you're in. He's in the same conditions that you're in. Your spirit is born of God. His spirit was born of God. Your body's made in the natural. His body was made in the natural. And the reason that this scripture is so important is because the second you deify his flesh, you have destroyed the power of the gospel to the human race. That is why, and I say it carefully, because I thank God, the Catholic Church, for what they did teach me. They helped me to fear God. But when they deified Mary, they proved they didn't believe this verse. Because they're identifying the woman he came from in the natural had to be deified. Otherwise, his flesh wasn't deified. It denies that he came in the flesh. And therefore had to elevate her to a superhuman status in order to keep him there. But I tell you, the miracle of the gospel is this, that Jesus Christ was God and man in one body, fully man and fully God, and conquered all of our problems, healed all of our diseases, and lived perfect in this body, proving and justifying the design of God. That the human race is not made for sin. When the right spirit is in this body, it performs according to God's purpose. Wow. That's amazing. All right, so this is good news because this relates to you. Now, where is Christ? Oh, he's in you. Oh, this is the great mystery, it says, right, in Colossians. This is a great mystery. Christ in you the hope of glory so Christ was in Jesus and Christ is in you so Jesus relates to the man from Nazareth Christ relates to the man from heaven Uh, we got work to do. Yeah. Your neighbors don't know this. You know what they see? They see a circle with a halo and Jesus, the bearded one, with a heart. And they're like, whoa, Jesus. See the picture, you know? And there he is. And you look at him, the only thing he's missing is an earring. And a tattoo. And he could be a Harley rider. <laughs> That's just a generalization. Just kidding. But <laughs> Come on, teen. You gotta, look, he's got a tattoo right there. <laughs> he's got a Harley. <laughs> Do no you got a hole in the ear? No beard, no, no. no beard, no hole. <laughs> All right, you weren't fully sanctified. <laughs> you know, but you look at the pictures, and, it, and the pictures tried to create a natural scene of sanctity, perfection. Jesus with a nice body, 
with a loincloth. Except he didn't have one on the cross. He was completely naked. I just suppose what will happen if we start carrying those crosses around. Do you know when they stuck Jesus to the side? Light didn't come out. Blood. When they beat him, he didn't say, Father. He screamed in pain. He had pain in the body because the body is not immortal. It's human. It bleeds. It hurts. It dies. Now, if he was a real God, you'd poke your spear inside of him and you would be turned into a stone. (laughs) You know, you would die. Glory would shoot out and kill you. And he would go on. But because he's a spirit man who's from God, he said, no one takes my life. At one point, he was in the midst of a great crowd, and they came to take him. And it says, in slipping through, they could not find him. What does that mean? Mactar stealth haze. (laughs) 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 And he didn't go to the Enterprise. He read the owner's manual and pushed a button and went stealth. There was another button there he read about water walking. Another one. If you forgive everybody their trespass, all of yours will be forgiven. You know what I'm saying? All the principles of God are true. And he learned what they were as a young lad and applied them to his life. In a human body, he caused a revolution to occur in the natural realm because he became a porthole for God's glory through his temple, the thing we blame for all of our problems. Now, the very thing you think is causing your grief and your problems is the very thing God wants to flow through. Mm -hmm. So it says, uh, verse 2, 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, By this you shall know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ came in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. It's not, there's no such thing as an Antichrist. There's no person Antichrist. It's a spirit. It's a defiling spirit. It's a spirit that's sent out, and its purpose is to get into the details and twist this gospel into something God's all supernatural, and you're just all human. He's perfect, and you're sinful. You're wicked, and he's glorious. Now come to the altar and repent. See, that's what it's for. It's to create a condition where we are ever weak, ever repenting, and ever feeling lousy about what we are, but glory to God, he's merciful. The devil is quite happy to give you religion. He prefers religion over no religion. Because then you have preconceived ideas that get built up in your soul through religion, and eventually when God talks to you, you can't even hear him. And your traditions negate the very word of God, because you're, you're locked into the tradition of it all. It's just like Christians, about Christmas and Easter and everything else. I celebrate, we have fun with the kids, we do all this stuff. Listen, I'm not in bondage to anything. But I tell you, Christmas has nothing to do with Jesus. And Easter has nothing to do with God. These are wicked pagan holidays. That's all they are. They married religion was the marriage of political things with the, the, the culture of that society in Rome. They put them together, and they created all these mythical things. And now, what do we do? We curse say, it's Christmas. We need to talk about Jesus and how he was born. He was born in this world. All right, so we do. 
I don't care. It doesn't bother me. I'll talk about Jesus being born every single time I preach. I think about Jesus every single time out my mouth. Because we're here to glorify the Son. But on Christmas is when people go to church. Why? Because they're heathens. Heathens go to church on Christmas and Easter. Christians are the church. We don't go to church on Christmas. We are the church. If we didn't gather, they'd have nowhere to go. So imagine a bunch of heathens are inside a building. Where are they? What do we do? They would start going through some religious exercise because that's what God is to them. But he's not a religious exercise to us. He's our father who birthed our spirit into us. This thing has been taken hostage. But now you know. You think, well, why don't we go to church? Because you didn't know this before you came. And then the next time you come, you think, well, gee, I'm going to consider worshiping God because that was amazing learning that about God. And then when you're, next time you're like, well, all right, God, and maybe even in the car on the ride home, you're like, oh, Lord, I, I just want to worship you. Hallelujah. That wasn't so bad. Are you there? Oh, God, if you're real, show yourself to me. And then I'm telling you, you start calling out to the living God, he comes. Comes. And then the religious become infused with God. It's spirit supremacy. All right, we got to get going. Good, hold me up. Lord, I got one scripture. Ow. Romans 7. Now, you got to hang with me quick through this. I'm not going to take much time. Maybe I'll call Mike Teed up here to preach this. Romans 7, 1. All right, ready? First one. Uh, or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has a dominion over a man as long as he lives. So the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the, ho- the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband. As long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Can you say, of her husband? Of her husband. Okay, can you say, the law, the, law the law of the husband? So there's the law of the husband. You can find this in Leviticus. Leviticus has all, the, all these laws and rules are there. And the book of Leviticus is the law of the husband. All right, so the law of the husband declares that as long as a man lives, his wife is under his dominion. Now, not many women want to live under a husband under the law. Now, I thank God for the liberation of women from the brutality of a system like that. However, it's real. Uh, And I want you to know this. God said to me the other day, the basis of marriage is submission of a woman to her husband. I was like, what? I said, I don't even preach it like that. He just said it to me. I was working. He says, without that, he was like rebuking me. He says, without that, there is no marriage. And I was like, yes, Lord, you're always right. Explain. I stopped gardening. He had all my attention. I was like, I am being corrected. And he said it again. The basis of marriage is the submission of a woman to her husband. Stop, period. And I was like, I don't like the sound of this. And uh, explain. And as I said there, Then he said to me, whether a marriage is good or bad is whether or not a man walks in the wisdom of Christ towards his wife. And I was like, he says, but it doesn't matter how much a man walks right if a woman doesn't submit to a man, there is no marriage. And I was like, I mean, to me, it was like a showstopper. I was like, what have I said? I mean, I'd be, I, I felt like I was under the microscope. So then I went back, and I was, I was like quoting my way in my mind through Ephesians chapter 5, and it says, it says, submit to one another in the fear of the Lord, verse 21, right? 
uh, verse 20. In verse 21 it says, wives, submit yourselves unto your husband. As to the Lord. And I thought, well, there it is, right up front, the very first thing. Same thing as he's telling me. And it says, now husbands, love your wife the way Christ loves the church. Laying down his life for her and cleansing her by the washing of the water. His word presents her to himself without spot or blame or any other such blemish so that she might be holy. And I saw it. There's good marriages and bad marriages. The basis of your marriage is singular. A wife's submission to her husband. That is the simple basis of it, and there's no way around it. It's a bad marriage if you don't treat her like Christ treats the church. But it's fantastic if you do. So God says choose life. But there's no marriage if there's no submission of a woman to her husband. There is no marriage. I was like, whoa, it just, my head was railing. And every scripture, I went back and started looking, they all said exactly what he said to me. He says, but choose life. So I suggest something to all of you. Treat your wife like Christ treats us. He goes to the crosses. He went to the cross to die for us, not me. I came by faith and received it. So he's busy, he's busy paying the way so that I could be blessed. So husband, this is how you ought to love your wife. But wives, come on. If you don't yield to your husband, you don't have a marriage. This is God's world. That's his world. That's what he designed. He's Detroit. <laughs> so you can read in 1 Peter chapter 3. I, I'm, I'm going off just a little bit, but I want you to know. It says, it says, it talks about women, honor your husband. And then it says things that I'm not comfortable with, like Sarah called Abraham Lord. All right, so what, it doesn't mean lordship. It means, it means that she was deferring to his leadership. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. It says, but husbands, love your wives, knowing that she's the weaker vessel, lest your prayers be hindered. Yeah. Knowing that you're both co-heirs of the grace of life. Yeah. Okay, so there's two things happening. One is the natural is addressed, the submission and the love from a husband to a wife. And the other is co-heirs of the grace of life. One's spiritual, one's natural. But both are spiritual in this sense that the spirit says this is what you do in a natural marriage and that's how it makes it work. Because marriage came from the spirit realm. Are we together? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so then any other such rubbish taught in schools or colleges or anywhere else in the world is wrong. The Bible's true. It will outlive universities. Do you know whole nations that used to speak against God's word are gone, and the word remains? Romans 7. All right. So can you say law of the husband? All right. So... A woman, according to Leviticus, under the law, says, is bound by the law of her husband until he dies. So some women pray for the early death of their husbands. Um, <laughs> that's a joke. <laughs> a lot of husbands die young. <laughs> if your wife is praying for you to live, that's a good sign. All right, verse, verse 2. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is freed from that law, the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. I'm not going there. There's so much to say. Uh, but if her husband dies... She is free. <laughs> That's not a good husband. <laughs> From that law. So that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Can you say another man? Another man. Whoa. Law of the husband. Okay. This 
is not the, the law of Moses. In the law of Moses is the law of the husband. Paul the Apostle is exerting, he's pulling out one law which gives a man dominion over his wife as long as she, he lives. And he's saying, this law, she's bound to her husband as long as he lives. Now look, just for those of you who are getting squirmy about something, I always have to address everything. If you're righteously divorced, there's reasons in the Bible for divorce, but they're according to the Bible. If, they, if you didn't do it according to the Bible, then you need to get on your knees, ask God to forgive you, and get cleansed from that wickedness. Go and tell people you're sorry. Get your life right. Get remarried or whatever you have to do. But get it right. Okay. All right. So this woman's bound by the law of her husband. If she just says, I'm sick of him. I'm going for him. She's an adulteress. So she's in violation with God. Naturally. Now, if he beats her, he does drugs, wickedness, does it, then she has a right to divorce him. The Bible's clear. Idolatry, any form of idolatry is a reason. Okay? I don't advocate just for any other reasons, by the way. We work with the man to try to get him free from all those things, and we have. And look, at you're all here. <laughs> <laughs> Starting with me. <laughs> Oh, dear Jesus. <laughs> okay. So, this thing then is about a husband. So, he's saying now, if her husband dies, she's free to marry another man. And this sounds like a happy thought here. You can hear it in the scripture. It's almost like positive. Because one husband's a tyrant and the other husband is good. Look at the next verse. Verse 4. Therefore, my brethren... You also have become dead to the law. What law? Law of the husband. Through the body of Christ that you may be married to another, even to him who's been raised from the dead. So there's two husbands. One is sin. And the other is Jesus Christ. He said as long as that, I better not use that word. A buzzard <laughs> is <laughs> as long as he's alive, you're bound by him. So this is talking about the nature of sin, the nature of darkness, the nature of wickedness, the satanic, evil, demonic nature was over the human race and owned us like a husband, and he had dominion over us all. And this is why our glorious husband, Jesus Christ, came into this earth. In the flesh. To do what? To prove the design of man, according to God, is flawless when you have the right spirit inside of it. And he took on the old husband to liberate the people of God from that wicked buzzard. <laughs> Isn't it awesome? Isn't God awesome? So you say, yeah, but when did the devil die? He didn't die. Jesus killed you. Amen. See, look, I'm, I'm 56. I remember I was 50. I remember I was 40. I remember I was 30. I remember I was 18. I remember 8 years old. I remember 6. I remember 3-ish. And you know. I've been here the whole time. What are you talking about I died? No, we're not talking about the natural man. Because the spiritual husband was in union with us spiritually, darkening our spirit man, cutting us off from God. But when it pleased the Father, he sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were all their lifetime subject to bondage. To redeem them out from under the law and to bring them back to God. Amen. This is the greatest superhero story ever. Absolutely. So then, you know, Jesus, meek and mild. Howdy doody, I'm just a carpenter's kid. <laughs> People are so stupid. It's amazing what they think. He conquered everything, he was no wimp. I bet you would not want to get into a hand wrestling their arm wrestling match with him. 
That was a rugged man. Those guys walked like... I look at the map, how far they went. I thought, I take planes, <laughs> trains, drive. They walked. And then they went back the next day. And I'm like, well, then that means they didn't sleep that night because it takes that long to walk. Tough people. But it wasn't talking about their toughness. It wasn't talking about their natural. It was talking about what he was in the spirit realm. Mm. So then, <clears throat> can you say I was in union with sin? But I died. I died. In, the spirit, in the spirit, God killed, God killed. My, union my union with the devil. With the devil. <laughs> oh, that's an inside joke. Uh, okay. Hmm. It's tough having your family on the front row. <laughs> it's funny. So, um, so people say, well, when did we die? I want you to know it was not your external man that died. It was your internal man. So you think, well, wait a minute. I thought my spirit was dead. How do you kill a dead spirit? <laughs> now, what is marriage? Marriage is two becoming one. We were married to the buzzard. Right? Right? Does that remind you of somebody? <laughs> I think it just comes right to you, you know. And uh, I can't even remember it three times in. <laughs> okay, so we were married to the buzzard. What does that mean? That means in the spirit, you were in union with sin. For this purpose was the Son of God manifest to destroy the works of the evil one. Jesus didn't come to fight a devil in the flesh. He came to destroy a union he shared with the human race. And on his way in the flesh, he cast out the sickness and disease and the problems and everything that that union caused in this world and showed that a man filled with the Spirit is an authority over an authority over the human race. He who has the word rules. So he took authority over the devil. The devil had authority over the human race. He had dominion over the human race. That's what it says. But Jesus didn't respect his dominion because he had a greater dominion and authority called the Word of God. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Oh, gee. <laughs> All right, Romans 8. And verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Okay, so here's Jesus walking the earth, and he's got a law inside of him. It's called the spirit of life. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of the buzzard. See, because you keep inserting action to the word S-I-N, because you've been indoctrinated by religion to believe what it's not, that's not what sin is. Sin is not the action. Sin is a nature. Sin is a spirit. Sin is a deception. And when you're deceived, you sin. The the, the way you get free from sin is not through repentance. The way you get free from sin is through revelation. When I'm revelated, it has no chance. When I'm dumb, you just lay aside the word of God and you're in trouble. All right, we together here. All right. So, there was a union, a marriage. Sin and us were married, right? Law of all husbands. God took us and killed us through associating us with Christ. When he died on the cross, he became our substitute. Therefore, we died. So spiritually, he substituted his life for ours so that we could be separated through death from sin 
that we might be joined to another man, even to him who was raised from the dead. Praise the Lord for the new marriage. Maybe we ought to have a reception. We have a reception. Christ in the church. Sit here. Seat of honor. And you think, well, I don't really kind of deserve that. And, you know, I'm just a sinner. No, you're not. You were set free from sin, and now you're joined to him. Sit down. And you're standing back up. You're going, well, Jesus, I don't really deserve to be a part of this. I know. That's why I did what I did, and I set you free from sin. Now stop thinking like the sinful husband, the buzzard, and start thinking like a, a, a wife of me, the one who's merciful and kind towards your sins. Even when you were dead in trespasses and sin, I was busy dying on the cross to redeem you from that wickedness. Amen. Now, if I did it then, how much more now that you're alive from the dead? Yeah. Don't cast away your confidence in his great reward. Yeah. Say, Pastor Chris, how do you get these sermons? I don't. I really, really, I kid you not, I have no clue. I still haven't even got to my message. Because <laughs> my husband keeps taking over. <sighs> Thank you, and you, you have all the right, so go ahead. And it's like, he does it. I'm like, sometimes I walk out of here and go. So, and I'm thinking, he has more control over me than I even think is possible. Because he wants to persuade us. It's as though Christ were pleading through us. Be reconciled to God. Stop fighting his love. Stop resisting grace. Allow his great work to happen in your life. All right. Last kind of thought. This is about spiritual supremacy. Oh, gee, is it? Is it? <laughs> This is like crazy. Romans 8, it says, verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Has? Past tense. Are you going to be free from sin? No. No, you will not be free from sin. You are. The deception is that you're not. Because sin is not an action. Sin is a nature. It's a spirit. Every time you start to go after sin, you're going after a spirit. And you begin to fellowship with a lie about who you are. Because what it does is that if you be the son of God. It questions whether you are. Turn these stone to bread. So we start praying for someone and praying for someone. They don't get healed and we go, oh man, we must not be sons of God. Well, you started off knowing you weren't going to get a healing. Because you weren't thinking like a son, and then when you confirmed it, the devil confirms it, then you walk away thinking, well, I must not be what God says I am. Right. Imagine Jesus. Let's just picture him. This blind guy comes up to Jesus. Jesus, my sight. He's blind. So then the blind guy comes up, and he, it says Jesus laid hands on him and prayed for his eyes. And then the guy opens his eyes, and he goes, People are long like trees. Jesus could have went, oh no, I'm not a son. I didn't get it done right. I think, what's up, Jesus? Do you have a bad day? Maybe the latrine was busy that day. And he didn't get a shower. And maybe he slept in the desert, and maybe he didn't have enough sleep that night or whatever, and he just didn't quite get the guy healed. The guy now is he's seeing people long like trees. So his, his vision is distorted. And Jesus could have gone back to the fire and said, Father, what's wrong with me? He didn't do that. He laid his hands on him again. Why? Because I am. I am the God who heals you. And he released the healing, and then the guy saw correct. You see, when you don't doubt what you're called to be, you don't put up with anything that resists it. All right, so he lived perfect. I didn't. He heard the Father perfectly. I don't. He walked extraordinarily. I didn't. 
All right, so I'm starting here, maybe in my concept, conceptualization, but I've come a long way, baby. The buzzard is getting further and further away from when I had union with him. And now I'm becoming more and more like the one who I'm in union with and his power flowing more and more frequently. Don't give up. Press further into the goodness of God. The things of God will come. They cannot be denied. All right, so it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says, My prayer to God is that you might be sanctified fully, spirit, soul, and body. Can you say, I want to be? Sanctified. Sanctified. Completely. Completely. Spirit, Spirit, soul, soul, and body. Okay. So when the old husband lost his dominion over us through our death in association with Christ, our spirit became sanctified. But your soul did not. There was a level of it that occurred right up front. But the vast majority of everything you've learned and experienced in your life that lies against the truth is still in you after you get saved. So your spirit is carrying the seed of heaven. That's what it says in 1 John chapter 4. It says, if his seed remains in you, you cannot sin. And everybody reads it and go, what does that mean? Because in spirit, I have been perfected, and as long as his seed remains in me, I cannot miss the mark. No matter what my outward conduct is in my soul realm, no matter what's going right or wrong in the soul realm, I, the spirit man, have the seed of Christ in me, and I cannot be separated. I can choose against it, but nobody can take it from me. Okay, that's powerful. So salvation does not mean you're thinking right. It means you have received the gift of God, the gift of grace, or the gift of righteousness by the grace of God. You've received a mere image in you of the Father. You are his offspring. That's powerful. Okay, but then in the soul realm, Paul says, I my prayer to God is that you might be sanctified fully. Spirit, which is soul, which is worked on, and body. So he's We're in the soul aspect of our lives today. God wants the success of the supremacy of his spirit in us to get into the soul realm. That's why Pastor Keith got up here. And he said, did you feel the presence of God? God's presence came down in the midst of us. And you think, so some of you might have thought, well, I thought we have the presence of God. And I thought we walk with the presence of God. How did it come down? Because there's a difference. In the spirit, we carry them everywhere. But in the soul realm, we allow his presence to come into that realm and change our lives. Change the way we think. Change the way we function. But to the degree we're open to him, it comes. And to the degree we're not, it stays out. So that's why we come together in corporate worship. You've got to give yourself to it on purpose. It's, you know, he habitates our spirit. He visits our soul, and he manifests in our flesh. Now, the manifestation of flesh equals how much I allow the supremacy of spirit to get into soul. (laughs) No, it's not complicated. He is in the temple, your spirit, inside of us. We are the temple of God. We carry the presence of God in us. I'm going to have to stop there. Um, so what's to be done? Well, what is evangelism? Spreading the news that mankind has been liberated from sin. Through Christ. So that people might discover the freedom that's available for them. And look, if you aren't first partaker, they aren't going to believe you. So you can be saved, you can have Christ in your spirit, and the grace of God's not making its way into your soul realm, therefore you don't think it, you don't live it, you don't walk it, there's no principles, you treat your wife wrong, you treat people wrong, you do things wrong, it's all out of order. Well, you have, you've got what I call cheap grace. 
It's like you allowed grace to reach one aspect of you, but you haven't allowed it to reach the next. And I don't want that. I want grace to move from spirit into thought. And once it gets into the thought realm, then it can start manifesting into this realm. So I have a question for you, and please don't answer. <laughs> oh, I get some interesting answers sometimes. Um, if we could look through the whole universe and the whole makeup and structure of the molecular all the way to space and beyond. And you could search everywhere, the smallest part to the largest part, to find an opening for the heavenly realm. Where does the heavenly realm eat into the natural realm? Where does it get in there? How does that happen? If there was, let's just call it a portal, if there was a, a hole, and we could, ah, oh, it's heaven. We start pulling goodies out. <laughs> Peace, salvation, healing. You know, you start pulling it all out. If you could find that poor hole, you would be the most amazing person. And Jesus said, life and death is in the power of your poor hole. Uh-oh. <laughs> Maybe it's a pie hole. <laughs> well, it's time to get that buzzer stop talking. Shut him up. Demons have to have permission to speak in this world. Same is true for the angels. They come through the sons of God. And every once in a while, because God has no one else, they speak through donkeys. God created the natural realm with words. The natural realm responds to words. The portal of heaven is the words that come out of your mouth. It's amazing if you raise a child and speak only blessing over them. Never say you're rotten, you're disobedient, even while they're doing it. But you declare to them what they are, they become obedient children. They become prosperous children. If you tell them you'll never have anything, you'll never amount to anything, you're, you were never planned, we didn't want you, and all that negative porthole is pouring demonic activity through your mouth. You are robbing them. And you're becoming, you're coming to fellowship with demons. You become a portal of hell to carry wickedness into your world and destroy your own children or your own wife or your own family or your own husband. But if you're wise and you have ears to hear, you realize that this tongue can set on fire the course of hell. Or it can become a tool of healing, regeneration, of strength to all those around me. I suppose that nobody could ever walk around declaring the word of God faithfully and shutting down the negative and stay poor, stay sick, and stay depressed. They would never happen because the word of God that made this realm will conform to the word that you are speaking in agreement with God. Your world is under the government of your tongue. 